Thank you all so much. What a good, you're so good at this. You're so good at your, give it up for this guy right here. My God. What's going on, y'all? Turn up, it's a Tuesday. Thank you for being here so early. The lights are so bright. Hi, Polly, take it away, I'm gonna shut up. Hello, everybody, thanks for coming out. Oh, Lily. So, wait, can I? Yeah, sure. So, so just so I all know, Polly and I work together. Polly, how long have we worked together? Six years. Six years. We talk to each other every freaking day, and we're both crazy, and now you're gonna be in on this conversation. I feel so bad for you guys right now. This, this is my first time moderating. First time moderator, Tonight. give it up, so, come on. Bear come with me. On. It's gonna be great, it's gonna be amazing. Ask me all of the things that you've never asked me before. Oops, I didn't prep for that. Okay, um, okay. let's go, baby. So, Lily, this is your first South by Southwest. Is this what you expected? So yeah, I, I think I have been to Austin before uh, on my tours, but I only got to see the hotel room, honestly. I'm loving Austin. I'm having an amazing time at the festival. I'm a big nerd. I love films. I love meeting other creatives. So it has been so fun to meet people just as nerdy as me. Like every person here is a nerd, and I love that. I love that about this. How many of y'all are nerds? Are, are they like, you're film nerds. That, that, that's what you are, right? Okay, the loudest cheer also was someone on my team, I'm pretty sure. Um, but yes, okay, so I just love meeting other creatives. Have you seen any movies? I have. I have seen some movies. Um, yesterday I saw Monkey Man. I know Dev and the, and the crew were just on stage. I thought it was phenomenal. I, I told Dev last night as well, this is a big statement. I'm going to make it, I think, the best action movie I've ever seen in my life. I'm going to say that. Took the number one spot. Uh, I saw Cryptic. I saw, I think it's pronounced Azrael, I think. I saw Babes, Alana Glazer's movie, which was also awesome. I'm just loving supporting all these other filmmakers. Tried any barbecue yet? I've not tried barbecue yet. What the heck? Where should I eat barbecue? Okay. DM her. D yes. DM me. <laughs> uh, so you recently received the, let's see, Comedy Crossover Award at Variety's Power of Comedy event last Friday. Correct. Will you tell us a little about uh, your journey crossing over? Okay, so this award basically, it was called the Variety's Comedy Crossover Award. In very blunt terms, it means that I was kind of important before, but now they've told me I'm actually important because I've crossed over. <laughs> That's what that award means. In 2010, is anyone familiar with my YouTube videos? It's okay if you're not. Okay, amazing, thank you. So in 2010, I started my career on YouTube. Um, I made a whole bunch of types of videos, you know, comedy, direct cameras, rants, talking, imitating my parents, whatever. Um, moved to LA in 2015. I've done a lot of things in the digital space. Then I wrote a couple books and I had a late night show. And during that entire time, I knew what I really wanted to do. I wanted to act. Like, I've, I've always wanted to act. I've wanted, I grew up with movies. I, it was my dream to be on the big screen and to write movies and to do what I'm doing now. So the award actually meant a lot. The crossover award meant a lot because I do feel like, if I'm just going to be really honest, when you start in the digital space, people have a tendency to pigeonhole you. Like, they will not let you evolve from that space. I don't know if anyone can relate to this or if you started on socials or do any work on socials, but people get very comfortable being like, this is your box. We're gonna put you in that box, you're gonna stay in that box. And I felt like no matter what I do now, people are gonna keep leading with just this many followers and she did that thing on YouTube. And I have nothing against the digital space, it gave me my career, but I think as a creative, you wanna grow, right? You wanna try different things, you wanna change the way you tell stories. And so I'm happy to say that, you know, I'm, I'm fully embracing TV and film and long, long, longer format storytelling. And so the Crossover Comedy Award really validated that, um, even though my parents will not care at all. Honestly. And what are some of the like, similarities between your experience back in the day on YouTube and what you're doing now? Like, what are, what's the synergy there? So I think that when I started to get onto bigger sets, like TV sets and, and film sets, there's a lot more money, there's bigger budgets, there's a lot more people, there's like 100 people on a set versus me and my team of four that like, can execute things. So there's a lot more people to work with, but I will say the one thing that is the same is story is still the most important. And I do feel like content creators understand that almost better sometimes than sometimes sets do. Because I think when you are on a big film set, there's so many moving parts, and you have so many things that you're thinking about. You think of the budget, you think about the days, you're thinking about the optics, the more, you're thinking about all of these things, and sometimes I have to tell people like, remember the story? Remember why we're here? Remember what we're trying to say? Um, and so I think that the thing I love about everything I've done is that I really have prioritized the story. So in our new film, Doing It, just like my YouTube videos, I'm like, how do I want people to feel when they leave? Like, what, what is the message I'm trying to say? And I don't want that to ever get lost. 
It's way harder to tell the story in film and TV, but I, I still want the story to be the thing. Excellent. All right, so today, as you guys might have heard, is the world premiere of our movie, Doing It. Oh, give it up one time. Come on, man. Come on. Stateside Theater, 5 p.m. Come check it out. And who's free at 5 p.m.? Please, come to Stateside, and let me sell this to you in the way it needs to be sold. How many movies, just yell out, how many movies have you seen so far here? Okay, so y'all know, whoever said seven, that some of the seats are uncomfortable. You know that. Some of the theaters are. Our theater has comfy seats. I tested it personally. Uh, doing it is our movie. 5 p.m. it is premiering. It, it's a sex comedy. Um, it was uncomfortable. But it was, it's so needed. Um, I'm sure you're going to ask me a bunch of questions about it, so let me not jump the gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell us about your origin story of how, how this film came to be. In 2019, we actually fact-checked this. We've been working on this since 2019. Um, an amazing creative by the name of Neil Patel uh, sent us this premise that I immediately loved, which was a 30-something-year-old Indian-American virgin finds herself accidentally teaching high school sex ed. And I was like, this is amazing. Also, this terrifies me because my parents are going to be mad at me. And so I, I, I think throughout my career, anytime something scares me, I know I have to do it. Anytime I've done something great in my career, the one common feeling I have is I'm so scared to do this thing. And so I love the premise. Um, we brought on an amazing director, writer by the name of Sara Zandia, who took a few passes. And then from past 10 to like 25, I, I co-wrote my first feature, which is this movie, Doing It. I learned so much. But I was like, yo, growing up, I never saw anything like this. I think, and I'm just going to get real, real. I don't know. I can't see with the lights of how many girls and women are here. Or I mean, how many South Asians are here. But any culture, I think, can relate to this idea of like, being so uncomfortable with sex. Growing up, it was the thing that would torment me. Like, I don't know if I know as much as my friends. I don't know if I'm like a loser. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm so uncomfortable with my body. And no one ever talked to me about it. My parents never gave me the talk. My school barely taught me sex ed. Um, I tried to Google things. I would overhear things at school. I just was so uninformed until like full-fledged adult life. Like I only recently learned, we'll get into the story, but I only recently learned that boys could not take off their penis. I swear to God. <laughs> because in not, sixth grade, in the playground, I didn't know anything about it, and I overheard a boy, and he, I swear he said he takes off his penis. And I was like, what? <laughs> and so I just didn't ask any questions. I just took this knowledge all the way until like the ninth grade, I swear, in high school. I'm like, I'm still not completely sure like what they do with their penis. Like when they take it off. So I'm assuming they like charge it at night. I don't know what's going on, like, you know what I'm saying? Only until recently, and I was like, oh, but it's just, it's, it was such an awkward upbringing, and I'm like, if I can make something where people watch it, and they realize, one, they're not alone, that like a lot of people feel awkward about this journey, and a lot of people, especially girls and women, have felt like they have to be ashamed of their bodies. Like, let me make a movie that addresses this head on, even though it's uncomfortable and scary. So that's what this movie is. It's full of sex jokes, but full of, full of message as well. So talk about how the film as a sex comedy tackles all those themes? Like, what's your approach to how you interweave these kind of heavy subjects into totally. an R-rated So subject? I'm going to keep it 100 with all y'all. This movie, I think a lot of people are going to like it. And I think a lot of people, uncles, <laughs> are going to be pissed. I do think some uncles and aunties will be pissed. And that was very scary for me because I was like, okay, I had a pretty reserved upbringing. Um, I'm now writing a sex comedy, and there's some scenes, like I, I won't give it away, but the opening of the movie, we go there. And it was a big conversation we had internally, because I was like, I think I was operating out of fear. I was like, okay, well, we don't want to do that because people are going to get mad. And I, I realized I kept saying answers like, we can't do that because people are going to get mad. We can't do that because people are going to get offended. Then I was like, wait, maybe that's why we have to do it. Because if I don't do that, if I don't go there, if I don't push the boundary, I'm not addressing the issue. And I think now I've created a film where if people watch it, and they will, and some people might be like, I don't, I don't know if I'm okay with that, I think they're gonna have to ask themselves why. Because what we're showing is like a completely natural part of people's lives, and it is a natural part of growing up. And honestly, I'm gonna say this how it needs to be said, if you're mad at the movie, it just features a sexually empowered woman. So you gotta ask yourself why. Like why are you offended about that? So I really had to force myself to go there knowing that my dad is gonna see the movie and knowing that you know he might be a little uncomfortable but I ma we made the choice, the very active choice to go there 
to talk about things. Um, I myself have scenes that I was like, I'm nervous about this, I'm uncomfortable, but I, I'm gonna go there and do this, and <sighs> we went there. And you've mentioned you're tackling all these difficult subjects like shame and sex and how uncomfortable that is. You're mentioning that you are gonna piss off a ton of uncles in this project. Or they're like, gonna be super cool about it, we'll see, we'll see. Maybe, maybe you can cancel, maybe not. Like, are, like what else is scary about this besides those? Are those the main things? Well, I care about the subject matter so much, so I'm definitely, like, I don't know if you, for those of you that follow me, you might know, Unicorn Island also has a charitable arm. My charity is all about empowering girls and women, specifically within the South Asian community, specifically in India, and the main way we do that is de-weaponizing shame. I really believe shame is a thing that upholds the patriarchy. Like, if you really look at it, it's like women are taught to be ashamed of their bodies, they're taught, they're, totally, they're taught to not speak out. It is not an accident, it is by design that women are shamed so that they don't speak out, so that they stay in their lane, so that the system can maintain the way it is and that certain people stay in power. I think as soon as you start eliminating shame from the equation, a lot of things will change. Um, but we have to unlearn that. I, this movie was me unlearning that, to be like, oh, why do I feel nervous about doing this scene? I should be empowered to do this scene, I should love my body. So I care about the subject matter so much, so I'm scared because I know the stakes are really high when you're trying to change culture in this way. But y'all, it's Unicorn Island's first feature. It's our first feature. <laughs> it's the first time I, it is the first time I am the lead in a film, the first time I've co-written a film, the first time I've produced a film. It's a lot of firsts. I really wanted to do well. So I'm very scared for all those reasons. And not to mention, I have to say, this film is independently financed. This is uh, Anita, who is our financers right here. She's a, a epic South Asian woman who raised all this money. Um, and a lot of people believed in it, and I want to make sure that they didn't make the wrong choice. I want to make sure that they can walk away from this being like, we need to invest in many more South Asian projects like this. So the stakes are high. The stakes are high. Whatever you're doing at 5 p.m., cancel that ish. The stakes of this are high. Can you rein it in? You're covering way too many of my questions. Sorry. Just kidding. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so you've talked, so you grew up, Second daughter of Punjabi immigrants in yes. Toronto. I also want to just point out real quick, how many South Asian people are here? How many Daisies? Raise your hand. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. I want to point out what Polly just said right now because I'm just going to keep it 100. Usually a white person would just say Indian or they would say South Asian. She specifically said Punjabi. And the reason I'm pointing that out is because you didn't ask this question, but I'm just going to go on a tangent for a second. Uh, a question I get often is how do you tell diverse stories because my team has a lot of white people and a lot of diverse people. And my answer has been, um, my team is not basic. My team will learn the correct terms and they will know the right words for things. In fact, every month we have a mandatory, not a mandatory, I'm lying. We, every month we have a Bollywood movie night where my team watches all of the Bollywood movies. They've seen, all, name a Bollywood movie you've seen, Polly, please. We won't, butcher your, we won't judge your pronunciation. Name any movie you've seen, go, go. Because any movie, come on. Any movie? Any movie that we watch at Bollywood movie night, go. Oh man, guys! I'm your favorite? What's your favorite? The one we just watched. Now. Your favorite? <laughs> um, let's see. Three idiots. Yep. She watched Three Idiots. Three Idiots. Right. Excellent. But the point I'm making is that I want to flag she said Punjabi because I'm really proud of her. Because, anyways, can you carry on? We try. We try. <laughs> She's giving me an education, guys. Yes. Um, so, obviously, you tackle a lot of, you know, let's say this movie is for everybody, mm -hmm. but it is told through a culturally specific lens. Mm -hmm. Talk about how you went about representing South Asian culture and Punjabi culture totally. in this film. Totally, totally. So I learned from a lot of things in my life, specifically uh, my short stint as a late night host, that representing South a the South Asian community is a blessing, and I'll be completely honest, a challenge. Because there is one billion South Asian people. <laughs> and so there's no possible way I, as one person, can represent all of those people. Because although we do have a lot of things in common, I could probably tell you stories about my childhood, and you'd be like, oh my god, same. There's also a lot of differences between us. My parents are not exactly like yours. My love life is not exactly like yours. My sexual journey is not exactly like yours. And so um, I'm telling a story that I know very intimately in this movie. It's true to me. It's true to the director. Um, but you might watch it, and you might say, I relate to this, or there's some parts I don't relate to. Um, and that I just had to embrace. That yes, it's, it's very South Asian in the sense that, you know, the mom, she's, we, we really went out of our way to make sure she wasn't a stereotypically strict mom. But having said that, I also didn't have a mom that was like, sex is cool, sex everywhere. I had to be true to a level of 
she's still a little reserved, but she's not super strict, and like that is true to me, and I hope people can see a little bit of their moms in that character. Um, you know, she does have a reserved upbringing. She goes to school in India, and so I was like, okay, what is true to Indian kids to you know during this time period? Let me let me embrace that, and so. I, the best I could do was what I knew, and I hope people see themselves in it, but I just want to be really honest and say that one of the curses of being part of a minority group in terms of representation, not in terms of number because there's so many of us, but in terms of representation is that that is true. Like we're just so, We so badly want to see our stories on screen, and we have a handful to choose from right now, and I think the challenge is we want that handful to represent all of us and all of our experiences, and it's just impossible to do. You know, it's impossible. I can't look at Never Have I Ever and be like, this needs to completely mimic my high school experience or I'm gonna be pissed. It just cannot happen. I think the real win is when you have such a range of stories and true representation is you're like, oh man, there's like so many stories to choose from that are South Asian that one of them is definitely gonna, gonna be the one that I resonate with. And that's a pretty like macro approach to how you approach the culture. I mean, for anyone who doesn't know, Lily is a perfectionist and incredibly detail-oriented. Correct. Pair that with making an independent film, and you get a lot of hands-on uh, work, I would say, on set. Talk about some of the like, little nuanced details that you infused into this project to make sure that the South Asian authenticity really resonated. So it is true. Everyone I work with, I used to like this about myself, then I stopped liking it about myself, and now I'm back to loving it about myself. I am a very involved person. Anything I do from me hosting a dinner to me being part of film, I don't just put my name on something. I'm like, I really care about what this is saying, the outcome of this, the quality of this, to the point where I hosted a dinner two days ago at South by Southwest, and before I confirmed, I was like, can you send me pictures of the table settings? I want to make sure the plates are nice. Can you send me the menu? No one can leave hungry. I want to make sure there's enough food. Like, I'm very involved like that. So with this film, there is a lot of small details that I was very adamant on. Um, one is growing up, I was very close with my grandfather. He's in some of my earlier YouTube videos as well. Um, his picture is in the wall, on the walls in the house, in the film. Uh, my mom was the cultural consultant of the film. So her younger images are also on the walls of the house. There's a lot of my personal family sentiments in there. Um, growing up, I was, I had two Tamil best friends, who, which is the reason I know a lot of Tamil, any, I mean, Tamil people in the house? Just you! <laughs> we like it, I see you, I see you, but the, you know, the, the opening shot of the, of the movie is Barnatiam, you know, so there's a lot of things from my, my the high school name is, is the, the school I went to, so there's a lot of personal touches in the film, a lot of uh, personal experiences of mine also went in there, and so, it's not based on a true story, but it's based on a true story. I think it's based on the true story of millions of girls and women, honestly. I think that's the truth. You're neglecting to talk about kurkuri, my favorite snack ever. Oh my God, yes. Sorry. She said kurkuri. That's how deep she's in. <laughs> she said kurkuri right, right just now. So yes, small things like I was like, you know, my character is eating a snack. I want it to be kurkuri. We have to go get kur Do you know how hard it is to clear some of these things? Can we just take a moment? One of the hardest parts of making diverse films is the fact that like, I need to be like, I want to use this gabi kushi gabi gum scene. And I, we got to track down this, the rights to this thing and kurkure getting like clearance on that is just, it's, it's, a, it's the wild, wild west in some ways, getting clearance. But we managed to get a lot of really cool things in the film. Stepping on my questions again. Sorry. Yeah, all right. You can ask it again. You, uh, all right, so as you mentioned, you starred in, produced, and co-wrote this script yep. with Neil Patel, the original screenwriter, and our director, Sarah Zandia. And this was your first time writing a feature script, yep. writing on a feature script. Yep. Talk about that experience, and did you like it? Are you going to do it again? Oh, I'm going to keep doing it. Like, I, I keep telling my investor over okay. here, I'm like, I have the next script almost ready, just saying. Um, I want to, I love this. You know, when I was making YouTube videos, I love that too, but I had, it was very immediate gratification. You come up with an idea the same day, I would shoot it, I would edit it, I would release it, and then it's on to the next one, on to the next one. And that works for certain ideas, but right now where I'm at is, I want to like sit with things for a while. I want to have several drafts. I want to think, okay, I did this, but like, is this the best it could be? How could I make it better? How could this character evolve even more? I'm just really enjoying sitting with creative longer, taking my time t telling a story and telling a message. Um, so I definitely want to do more. But I will say I'm still learning. Like I 
this experience really taught me, okay, this is not a seven minute YouTube video. This is an hour and a half movie. How do I, what is the arc here? What is the story structure? And I was so lucky because I worked with such experienced, awesome people that taught me along the way from actors to people behind the scenes as well. So yes, my, I, this next chapter of my career is dedicated to TV and film in that way where honestly, I might stop being a basic, a basic on Instagram. I don't know, we'll see. It's a hard thing to let go of, but I might have to let go of that a little bit. All right, I see yeah. that. What do you miss about the short form storytelling as you're delving into long form? Hmm. What do I miss about people dragging me on the internet? <laughs> this is such a tough question. No, I will say, listen, social media, I've been very clear about this. It is a double-edged sword. I love it and I hate it at the exact same time. It has given me my entire career. Um, but it's also very mentally unhealthy. One of the things, not to get too deep, that I've had to work on over the past two years is after a decade of making stuff for social, my brain is wired and conditioned to only think of success in a certain way, which is through numbers, and did this go viral, and did, how much engagement did it get? Like, the number of times I would check analytics and insights in a day was compulsive. It was like seriously problematic, and then I decided one day, I was like, all right, I wanna get into TV and film now. And I believed that I was gonna be able to snap and be like, and now I'm doing that. And my brain couldn't. I'd be working on scripts where I was like, I still need to make a funny thing for Instagram because if people aren't watching me there, how am I gonna do this other stuff? I'm not successful. People are saying I'm not relevant. I'm not successful. And I talked to my therapist about it and I was like, I'm in this trap where I have new goals and I have new ambitions, but my brain has a compulsion where it keeps forcing me to chase the same goals I've already accomplished. Like, I've had viral videos, but my brain is like, you need to keep doing that. I have sold merch, and I've had sold out tours, but my brain is like, you gotta keep doing it. But you can't keep doing that if you're trying to also accomplish new things. And so it's taking two years, literally, of my brain being like, it's okay if you don't post this on Instagram. It's okay if a million people didn't watch this comedy clip on YouTube, it's okay. Because guess what, you're making space for new growth. That's been super, super hard. Um, but the thing I do miss is that on YouTube you, and, and I, Instagram, you get immediate val validation. You get that immediate rush of people being like, I relate to this, I love this, and there's a little bit of a community there. I miss that, which is why I'm so excited for tonight, because it's, it's a moment for that community to happen again. Um, I just, I really love the people that, that w connect with my content. And I hope I get lots of opportunities to connect with them in person. Well, doing it is for sale at this festival. We are out, up for distribution. Where the buyers in the room at? Yeah, I know guys, you're all here. You guys have a checkbook. You want to come talk to us after the movie? That's cool. Um, but you know, there's a chance it might sell to a streamer. Uh, we, you know, that doesn't always share those metrics and data. So how how are you going to measure success for this movie? I will break into their buildings. I will <laughs> hack their computers. Um, okay. This is another thing I've had to, so and in anticipation of tonight's premiere, I've been excited, I've been nervous, y'all. I've been nervous and I've had to think a lot in my meditations. What, how are you defining success for this film? And I think I'm in the minority with this answer because I don't know if my investing group is gonna agree with me, but I'm not gonna make eye contact with you, I'm gonna go over here. Um, I will be happy and glad and relieved if we break even. It, I will be happy. I'll be like, oh, that's, that's so lovely. That is, what a privilege to break even. That'd be amazing. It'll be so great if it makes money because so many people put their money into this and I, I want so badly for them to make money. Um, but for me, my number one metric of success is I just want it to be successful enough for me to do it again. I think I want to make sure that it creates enough buzz where the next film I do is a little easier. It's a little easier to make is that the next time there's a story that's told through a, through a South Asian lens, people are less hesitant, that a buyer is less hesitant, that an exec is less, I just want to chip away at that path to be like, oh yeah, doing it, okay, that, you know what, that was good. This we don't have to overthink about. Because the reality is, you know, I do live in a situation where I, I think sometimes we have really great ideas and we go into a, and I'm not calling any specific, ex actually, am I gonna call specific execs out? I'm not. But there are a lot of times I go into a room and there's this really great idea, and it'll be like, oh yeah, but you know, Slumdog already happened. Or never have I ever, yeah, it already exists. There's that one girl in Sex Lives of College Girls is kind of similar to that. That season of Bridgerton, you know, happened. And <laughs> I'm like, they, people really do group all, 
all diverse stories into these lumps like that. And so it's really hard to get things made because it already existed in that instance. So like, we can't have two of those things. And I'm just like, how many spy movies exist? How many spy kids exist? How many Mission Impossibles, you know what I mean? So I think when you're in a diverse minority group, you're still so much proving yourself over and over and over again in the way other cultures and, and films don't have to prove themselves. So if I have to prove myself and this culture and our stories a little bit less with the next project, then this project is a success. That is my only <laughs> measure of success for me, personally. So you're referencing yourself as a part of a diverse minority group, yet some of us may know South Asians actually take up a quarter of our global population. Mm -hmm. Reconcile that and why- Polly taught me that stat. You know, like why do you think this group is, this culture is still being regarded with tokenism in entertainment? Well, I think a few things. So I was um, born in Canada. And I was born specifically in Toronto, which is very, I will still say after travel. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, who's Canadian? Oh, I thought you looked polite up front here. <laughs> I got polite vibes from you. I got polite vibes from you. Um, I will say after traveling the world, I still think Toronto's the most diverse city I've ever been to. I didn't have a single friend growing up whose parents were not immigrants. Not a single one of my friends didn't know another language, didn't eat, you know, didn't watch movies growing up that weren't in English. Then I moved to LA and it was kind of a culture shock in that way because immigration patterns are different in America and California. And I met other brown people and I was like, oh my God, like, so where are your parents from? And I'm expecting them to say like, Gujarat. And they're like, Ohio. And I'm like, oh. That's different, but cool, but different. And so I do think in America, which is one of the biggest markets and you know, the market of focus a lot of times is still kind of catching up with this idea of like, oh, South Asians, because I will say it, it is kind of black and white. You know, it's, there's a lot of minority groups where people just don't get it. I, I literally had someone ask me, I was like, I love soca music, which is like Caribbean music. And someone literally said to me, is that Bollywood? Like that's the level I had someone ask me, what is a samosa? What is a sari? And I was like, what? Like growing up in Toronto, every person knew those things. And so you're nodding, you know what's up. Um, you're like, I have a samosa in my pocket right now. She didn't know what's up, you know? <laughs> but I think there's just a learning curve. And I'll also just say, I don't want to play the blame game. There is work to be done on, on the studio side for them getting an education. But I'm also going to have to say, South Asian community, we got to take a little ownership here as well. Because for things to be popping, you got to show up. And I think historically, uh, we've been taught from our elders, not on purpose, but because of their trauma, that we have to compete with each other. And there's not room for all of us. And we got to tear other people down. It's always, your cousin did this. And do you know what they did? And she's better than you. And so we all grew up being like, we can't support each other. No, if I support you, I'm going to lose. If I support you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be knocked down. And we have to unlearn that trauma. We have to show up for each other. And we have to be like, no, we want South Asian stories. And we want that. And we can't tear them down. So we have to take ownership over that as well and band together a little bit. All right, some work ahead. So you've mentioned that in this movie, you play Maya, who gets a job, or accidentally gets a job teaching high school sex ed, but she's a virgin. How relatable was Maya's experience to you personally? Oh my God, how honest am I gonna be right now? Like, I, this is my debate, I'm such an honest person, but then I'm like, why did I say that? <laughs> but I think I'm gonna just be honest. I am gonna be honest, because, yeah, I am. Because I shouldn't be embarrassed, because the whole film is about not being embarrassed. I'm, I'm gonna be honest. Um, I was very uncomfortable with sex for most of my life. Um, I was very scared of dudes for most of my life for that reason. I came out very late in life, so like I equally don't know enough about things about women, <laughs> um, to be honest. I'm just like, tell me about everyone's bodies. I don't even know about my own. Um, was terrified and didn't know how to use a tampon for most of my life, honestly, until I became, I see some people nodding. I fought for that line to be in the movie. There's a line in the movie about that. And a lot of people were like, really? I don't think that's relatable. I'm like, I think it is. I actually think it is relatable to a lot of cultures because I was taught just, if you're, if, you're, if you're embarrassed, that's fine, but can anyone relate to that sentiment? And I don't wanna put you on the spot. Okay, good, good, good. But uh, I was taught that you know, don't sit on a boy's lap. You'll get pregnant. I was taught that if you use a tampon, you you'll, won't be a virgin anymore. Um, I, in school, was taught if you even kiss a boy, like herpes, boom, <laughs> immediately. You know? So I relate to a lot of the fear tactics in this film. I was terrified. My first boyfriend, I was like, vividly remember reporting to my friends 
oh my god, oh my god, okay, so like something happened between his name was Nick. I have this thing where for some reason almost all of my boyfriends are named after the Backstreet Boys. It's really weird. <laughs> Minus Howie, I've dated every one of the Backstreet Boys' names. It's a very bizarre thing. Um, but I remember I like ran to my friends. This was in, this was in high school, y'all. I ran to my friends, and I was like, oh, something happened between me and Nick, and they're like, oh my God, oh my God, tell, 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 and I was like, okay, I'm really nervous, like, don't judge me, I'm like, we just held hands. <laughs> and I was freaking out over the fact that I publicly held hands with a boy, and that's where I was at. Like, that's where I was at. I was embarrassed to talk about my period, I was embarrassed to talk about my bra, it was just like very uncomfortable for me for a long time in my life. And if a movie like this existed, I feel like I just would have felt a little more normal growing up being like, oh, I'm not the only, because I really felt like everyone else had it figured out, just me. I was the only one that didn't have it figured out. And that's just not true. We just don't talk about it enough. So I didn't know how to use tampons for most of my life. <laughs> if you can relate, don't be embarrassed. You're not alone, I promise. Make that a gift, please, someone. <laughs> Put that on TikTok, make my day. As you were researching and kind of writing on this script, did you learn anything about sex education that you didn't know before? Y'all, my search history is a hot mess. <laughs> like, if anyone goes to my laptop, they're gonna be like, she's a freak. Um, yes, I learned, I, I thought that this issue of sex ed not being taught in schools was just like a my generation thing, but it actually still happens today. I did not realize that. While making this movie, I talked to a lot of my um, cousins who are teachers, and I was like, this is like not a thing anymore, right? And they're like, no. Parents will write into the school still and opt their kids out of sex ed. It is not a mandatory thing. Teachers sometimes refuse to teach it. Some schools ban it. Different countries in different states and different provinces all have different rules. It is not a regulated thing by any means. I think that's wild. I don't, if you're a parent, can you raise your hand real quick? Okay, cool. If you plan to have kids at some point in your life, can you raise your hand real quick? So many people are not raising your hands, and I'm like, you're so smart. Um, <laughs> geniuses, honestly. I'm still unsure, but I was like, I didn't realize there's still this, and I don't want to be rude, but I am going to call that a delusion of parents thinking that their kids are not going to learn this. Parents are still to this day being like, I'm not going to talk to my kids about this. They don't need to know this stuff. And I'm like, do you really believe that your kids are not learning this with the internet, with people at school, with everything that exists? Like, that is a level of delusion that I'm just going to have to call you out on. If you do not talk to your kids or your teachers don't talk to your kids, they're going to learn. It's just not going to be from an accurate source. So I was like, my mind was blown to realize that people still have this mentality, but it's very prevalent. Now, we were talking to a school teacher when we were up there, and she was saying how Canada has this curriculum where they teach sex ed across the board, but it's the one class that people can opt out of, that parents can opt their kids out That's of. Wild. The only one in the curriculum. Like, the so. class you should be able to opt out of is history, because that is just a lie. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that should be the class that you opt out of. <laughs> Don't get me started. Um, I'll answer your question one more way, and this is going to be, uh, I won't get into too much detail, but I will say, one of the challenges of this film, I actually have a list on my phone called Person of Color Challenges that I learned from this film. It's a list of things I was like, I wasn't expecting that, that was hard. Um, because sometimes people will come up to me and they'll be like, can you give me an advi any advice? Something that's in my search history is darker Indian man penis. <laughs> and the reason is because one of our cast members is the fabulous Utkar Shambhadgar who is in the film, um, I don't know if you're familiar, but he's a darker skinned Indian man and there may be a scene where he's got his peen out. Or not. Or, or not. not, maybe not. It might not be his peen, it might be a, a fake, we don't know, you decide. But the point is, I, there was a moment where I was like, had to ask myself the question, Utkarsh was like a brother to me and I, I had to call him and be like, just wanna understand what the shade of your penis would be to ensure that this is accurate. So I had to, uh, have that conversation with my dear friend Othgar about the color of his penis. And that's in my search history. And I had to create an entire mood board of said thing. There was a penis mood board. There was a penis mood board. And that was the one email out of the entire production that Polly looped in the wrong person. <laughs> so we, you looped in like an exec from like a different... An agent. <laughs> like the he one was email. He was a friend, he was a friend. One email, full penis mood board. Not even as an attachment in the body of the email. In the body of the email. Thank you for yes. watching that. Yes. Classic.
Classic. All right. Well, you're talking about some challenges of this movie. Yes. So this was Unicorn Island's first time producing a feature film. And we, we brought in, you know, a veteran independent producer, Antti Bregman, and Likely Story Productions. Yeah, Oscar yeah. Turner, no big deal. But we also brought in some first-time financiers, some Camelback Productions, Anita. Shout Bata. out, shout out, shout out. That big round of applause you know? to, take a, to put your money and be like, we're going to bet on this. Sh big shout outs. Great. Super brave. So let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges of making an independent movie as a first timer. You're poor. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> this question is making me sweat, actually, because I'm nervous about this now. Um, I'm just kidding. I wanted you to show you that my vest is cool. Um, thank you. It was in the description of Yeah, this my stylist is going to be like, you wore the freaking jacket the whole time. How dare you? Um, the challenges are that. Listen, movies take a lot of money and a lot of time. Um, and if you're not in the business, I think when you hear the numbers, you're like, that's so much money. But you don't realize how quickly that money gets spent. Um, there's a lot of people involved in a production. Um, so to make a dollar stretch is very, very difficult, especially because you're trying to do two things at once. You're trying to tell an accurate story for a, for, for, through a cultural lens where you're like, I want to do right by them. I want to do right by them. I want to make sure it's quality. I want to make sure we can have all the references and all the things and the music. And then you're like, oh, but I also like have a limited set of resources that other films don't have and how can I accomplish both of these things? Um, so it is really challenging because when you're part of a project like this, um, people are looking for every excuse to write it off. Honestly, that's, that's the truth. People in power that make decisions they are looking for every excuse to be like, yeah, well, that didn't work. Well, that didn't really whatever. Well, let's see the quality. They're, every excuse, they're looking for that. And so you're like trying to combat that with limited resources. And you're learning. It was our first film. It was our investor's first film. We're like learning this stuff as we go. Um, and so it was just like a crash course up against a lot of obstacles, you know, post-pandemic, pre-strike. There was just so many things going on and you're just trying to make the best possible project. Um, but is there a challenge you're thinking of specifically? I was curious, like any lessons in particular that you took out of this as far as, I mean, yeah, I mean a challenge I would say in particular was, frankly, it's really important to us as a company that focuses on underrepresented voices to make sure that there uh, yes. is that representation represented totally. in front and behind the camera. Care well, to let expand me, Lily? Correct. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I'll just keep it real. I'm gonna, I, I, I keep saying I'm gonna keep it real, but that's because I always have to use it as a disclaimer. It's like you're not gonna get a BS answer here. Um, for me, it is so important that as many people as possible, I was like, this is a movie, I wanna make sure there's as many diverse people, specifically even South Asian people that can understand what we're trying to do. And like I said, I wanna emphasize, the movie's not just for South Asian people. Like anyone's gonna see it and be like, oh God, I relate to this, but it's told through that lens. And so I was like, I wanna make sure that behind the camera, in front of the camera, there's a lot of South Asian people. We ran into two challenges, which I get. Like we shot in Toronto and there's a handful of people in the union that are South Asian for any given job. And if there's another show that's like has a diverse cast, they've booked those people. So literally when I say like, there is no person for us to go to, there was no person sometimes where I'm like, there's just not enough representation in these unions that we have to mine from to get these people. The second issue is we have limited resources. Um, and make no mistake, I, we, me and Polly, our fees, my fees, we have put them back into the movie. <laughs> like, we are not, when I say I'm probably gonna walk away with no money, like, that is a real thing. I put a lot of money and resources into this movie because I, I feel like I'm in the position to be able to do that. But when you have someone that you're trying to hire for a job and you're like, industry standard is here for this job, our budget is here, and this is what we have, it pains me so much to go to a person that's South Asian and be like, this is all I can offer you because, like, they're so used to hearing that. I heard that for my whole career. This is how much we got for you. We can't offer you more. And I'm just like, all right, like it is what it is. And it pains me to do that because those people are worth so much more, but it's just what we're working with. So that was a big challenge as well to be like, we want to use these people. We don't have a lot to offer them. So I called up a lot of people to be like, I don't have money to offer you, but here is why I love this project and why I want it to win. And if you're aligned, like let's do it. But it is very, very difficult and hard to sometimes get the diver diversity. It doesn't mean you can't, I'm gonna keep trying, I'm gonna keep doing it, but there are some real challenges that can't be ignored. Indeed. Yeah. So in this film, we actually first meet your character, Maya, when she's in middle school. Yeah. This is gonna be our last question before we open it up. We're gonna do audience night. questions, and I want y'all to hit me with some hard yeah. effing questions. No basic stuff, please. But what, if you could go back and tell middle school Lily any piece of advice, what would that be? Ooh. 
I learned this in my 30s. I know, I don't look a day over 22. But I learned this in my 30s. And it sounds silly to say, but I didn't realize that as an adult, or as a person, forget getting an adult, you're allowed to make decisions that are right for you. I know that sounds so silly, but for my whole life, I was just told, this is what you're supposed to do. This is the linear life. This is what girls do, this is what they don't do, this is when you're supposed to speak up, when you're not supposed to speak, which is your dress, which you're not supposed to dress. Um, and I just accepted it. I was like, makes sense. Everyone else is doing it, sure. And only in my adult life was I like, wait, I think I can unlearn that and decide that that's not actually right for me. If I did that from a younger age, I would have been such a healthier, happier person way earlier in my life. But for too long, I was just like, tell me what to do. I will just take it and keep doing it. It doesn't work for me, but I'm gonna keep doing it. Um, I would have unlearned that sooner. I would have told her to learn that sooner. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. All right, we're going to open up to some of your questions. Yay, uh, yay. We like this one a lot. It's a spoon feeding into all the things we want to hear. Perfect. Why is comedy your tool of choice to make impact, and what other tools support this? Anonymous. Who's anonymous? Who asked this question? Do you want to get some credit right now? Yeah, be proud. No? Oh, they're like, it's your publicist. Um, <laughs> I, that's why I actually said that, because I knew it was going to be you. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, this is an important question. Um, I feel like growing up, every subject was taboo. Mental health was taboo, sex was taboo, everything. And I needed comedy to talk about it. Like, I, comedy was the only way I could talk about those issues without me feeling uncomfortable, other people getting upset. I feel comedy is the best vehicle to talk about important things because it allows people to put down their defense mechanisms. I feel like everyone, especially today, we're so defensive, we're so like, no, but I'm right, and you're this, and I have to oppose you. And comedy is the one thing that kind of, it should allow you to be like, let me put that all aside for a second. I'm like, we can laugh about this and talk about some important stuff. So that's what the film does. It has a lot of scenes that I honestly would probably not do if it wasn't for comedy. And so I think it's just the most, um, the best vehicle for driving impact. Cool. Now we have non-publicist questions, which I love. Yes. Not um, that I don't love you, you're great. <laughs> um, okay, Nicole H. Uh, mentions that, she's, that she loves that you're passionate about helping youth better understand and not be ashamed about sex. But what age do you think should be, what's, what's the appropriate age to watch your film? I'm gonna get in trouble. Um, okay, so obviously it's a sex comedy. Proceed with caution. There is raunchy sex jokes. I do not think super young kids should probably watch this film. Having said that, if you believe a child is at the age where they're hearing about it anyways, like if I, uh, take this with a grain of salt, I'm not a parent, but if I was a parent, I would absolutely want my child, specifically my daughter, to see this film. Because I think, yes, there's sex jokes and it's raunchy, but what it's really teaching girls is like, don't listen to the shame, don't listen to the judgment, learn about your body, learn about sex, learn that you have choices and options and decisions are yours. Never seen that in a movie growing up myself. I would want my daughter and my kids to see this movie, personally. So I'll answer it in that way. My only add to that is as the mom of a six-year-old girl, I'm going to wait a few years, but maybe around the time she's getting a sex ed education, this would be a perfect companion. Totally. And I, and I will also say that, I know we keep saying, the movie's about a virgin, but a virgin. The virgin is not the butt of the joke in this film. Like, growing up, I think the best comp in terms of subject matter is like 40-year-old virgin. Where the whole movie, and it's an amazing movie, it was, I watched it before we shot this and it's iconic, but it is very about like, something's wrong with me and like, and at the end I lose my virginity and now I'm like, oh, thank God I can be no, kind of normal. This is not, I'm not, the message is not that to be normal, lose your virginity. The les lesson is not like, <laughs> virginity is a made up construct to begin with, a really straight made up construct. So it's not the butt of the joke. And I think that's an important message for, for girls to, to hear. Indeed. Um, we touched on this a little bit, but can you expand how when you switched from making YouTube videos to the, to the kind of longer form content, what was your biggest struggle? Emily B. wants to know. So my biggest struggle is that for YouTube, I made all of the decisions pretty much. I was like, I know how much it's going to cost. I can use someone's music. The worst that will happen is get taken down. I don't need to get everything cleared. There's no legal. There's no like person going to giving me notes. And when you make a film or when you move into other spaces where your creative team is bigger, there are notes. And Polly will attest to the fact that sometimes I'm very precious. I'm like, no, this joke has to go in and I will die on this hill. Um, but I've learned, and I'm learning probably actively still, of like, 
actually like there's merit. There's merit to a creative team being like, what about this? Can you think about this this way to challenge yourself creatively? But I will also say the struggle is that everything is so expensive. I will answer this by saying we ran out of money for our music budget towards the end of the film. I wanted to make sure the music was like, I was like, I want to have like a Desi South Asian flair, like our music is so dope, I want to infuse it. It's expensive, music is so expensive. However expensive you think music is, it's 10 times that. It is so expensive. And towards the end of the edit, we ran out of money. So actually, um, the movie, in the last week of post-production, I wrote an original song in two days for the film. And it is the credit song and the final scene. And it's the original song I wrote because we just didn't have money. So stay tuned for that. If you come to the to film, don't leave before the credits because there's an original credit song. I don't know if you guys picked up on that flex. Lily is also a songwriter and performer in this. So uh, just, just throwing that out there. No big Pretty deal. Cool. Pretty cool. What? Okay, what was the biggest challenge as an actor on doing it? Annabelle wants to know. So... <clears throat> this is my first lead in a future, like I've said. So it was really sitting with a character for a longer time than I'm used to. Uh, and she's doing freaky things. And as a person, I'm already pretty reserved. Like when I talk to my friends, I used to be that person that was like, had to whisper the word sex. I'd feel a little bit uncomfortable saying the word penis. We've had like 55 meetings about a dildo at this point. So like that ship has sailed. But um, it was, some of the intimacy scenes were really tough for me. Like, I don't know if anyone here has shot an intimacy scene, but there's an intimacy coordinator and you have to talk about it in great detail. It's like my, all of my trauma. I was like, oh my God. So I'm like standing across from this guy and she's like, so tell him what you feel comfortable with him doing. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I had to walk him through every part of my body he could touch and how he could touch. And I was like, this is so out of my comfort zone. But that was a huge challenge, like the intimacy scenes. And some of them, it's just me on camera. And I'm like, there's no one else to lean on. It's me and the camera. I'm doing some stuff. Like, I'm cautious. And then I, I think I just, it was, a, it was an exercise in letting go. And just being like, you have to let go. It's not about looking cool. Actually, Kunal Nair taught me this, if you're familiar with Big Bang Theory. He was one of the first people I ever acted with. And he always taught me that. He said, when you start acting, you'll have a temptation to try to look cool and pretty and all of these things because, like, you're so worried you're on camera. He's like, you got to let go of all of that. It's not about looking cool. It's about looking like the character. It's about looking like what that moment's supposed to look like. And so, man, I've watched this movie 50 times, and there's one scene where I'm like, my nostrils are so big. And i got to let that go. i got to let that go. I think your nostrils are awesome. They're big. They're big in this moment because there's a reason they're big in that moment, and you'll find out. <laughs> So, let's see, Anonymous wants to know, what's the number one universal sex ed lesson that you would share with someone? Um, the universal message I would give is this whole way we try to control girls and women about virginity is a goddamn lie. It's not true. It's a complete myth. Um, and virginity is also a very heterosexual construct. And I think for most of my life, I was like, don't ride your bike like that. Don't do that. Virginity, virginity, virginity. And it's like shut the F up, like it's not a thing. And it's not something that needs to govern girls and women's lives and it has no association with their value or shame or anything and I think we need to stop teaching about that in school because it's messed up. Yeah. Come on, round of applause for that. Samir has a really good question. This is an inventive one, thank you Samir. Uh, if Maya from Doing It, who's her character, mm -hmm. had a YouTube channel for her adventures, what's a video that would go viral? <laughs> You're asking her to write a YouTube video concept on the spot, you realize. Wow, I love, so if Maya had a YouTube video, what is the concept she would do? I'm, I'm seeing some sort of vibrator ASMR situation. I'll be really honest, for some of my scenes, your girl had to practice before shooting. And I was like, what turns me on? It was an exercise of me being like, what? And I would like whisper things to myself before we shot certain scenes. You know, I was like, Someone returning my Tupperware. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, like things like that that I was like, well, things that really turn me on. Like, I, it's a, I would whisper a lot of things. So I think like a sexual ASMR would be like, my mom's proud of me. Oh, yeah. You know, things like that. Things like that that were like, yeah. So I think it would be that. All right. Yeah, I'm hearing a little bit of method acting going into this. A little bit. Had to, was there any things you were else, you, any other things you were trying for the first time that you had to like, you know, as, as an off-screen version of this character, like, how did you prepare? 
I did Google a lot of sexy things. Um, sometimes a creative team and people would mention positions and toys. And I was like, cool. I'd go home and Google it because I had no idea what the hell they were talking about most of the time. Um, I had to learn different positions because there's a, there's a scene about that in the thing. So it was a, honestly, to amend my previous answer of why this movie would be a success for me, it healed so much of my trauma, honestly. This film healed so much of my personal trauma. So I don't care which critic or uncle is pissed because like, it has changed my life, honestly. I became so much more comfortable with my body. So I want to go back to my mom did help on the set of this film. She was a cultural consultant. And an hour before I submitted the script, this is a true story, it was like 11 p.m. and I was about to submit the script and I had a moment of terror because I was like, I, don't, I never told my mom about this movie. And so I FaceTimed my mom. And I was like, Mom, I know I'm 35 years old, but I need to ask you, do I have permission to do this movie? Um, and she said something so sweet in response. She said, are you okay doing the movie? And I was like, I am. And she's like, then I think it's fine. But then she asked me follow-up questions. <laughs> and one of them was, well, what's in the movie? And this was like, a, I was on, the top, clock was ticking, I had to submit the script. So the, for the first time in my life, in this five minute FaceTime, I was like, mom, we've never talked about any of this stuff, we've never talked about this, but like, there's a vibrator scene, there's a masturbation scene, there's a this scene, there's that scene, and she's just like, mm-hmm. And then she said two things to me. One thing she said was, well, I've watched a Medigan buy. And I was like, okay. She's like, I liked it. I was like, okay. <laughs> And then she's, and this is the final thing she said, and I was like, why God, why? She said, do you use a vibrator? And I was like, and that is the day I passed away. <laughs> and I've been dead ever since. But the point is that like my mom on set, me and her started talking about sex. She started to make sex jokes on set. Like it even healed our trauma together. So like I, you should watch this and it could be the first movie you watch with your parents and you challenge each other not to cover each other's eyes. Like, let this be the first film, but um, yeah, it was really special. That's gonna be our tagline, doing it, bring your mom. 100%, yeah. <laughs> bring your mom. Maybe your mom's never seen a movie like this. Honestly, going back to age, forget how young, how old can they be? Bring your grandma. She's probably never seen anything like this movie. Like, give them the permission to also be like, damn, I didn't know. My mom is probably gonna watch this and be like, I didn't even know I could enjoy these things, you know? So I think we should bring all, all of the people who have this trauma. All ages, over 18. Um, okay, Jenna would like to know, she's a college student prepping for a career in the entertainment industry. Address it, oh sorry, someone just looked, okay. What's your biggest piece of advice for women who wanna work in comedy? How much time we have here? We have six minutes, okay. <clears throat> um, it's a very cliche answer for me to say it's very hard, but it is very hard. But I wanna add to that by saying, um, it, being a woman in comedy is super frustrating. You will be undervalued ev almost every single time. Um, I did a TED talk about how, subtle flex, I did a TED talk about how we think that equality is a seat at the table. And for much of my career, I thought that. Get in the show, get the spot, get the role, you made it, you did it. And then when you get there, you're like, oh wait, still people aren't listening to my ideas, still people aren't taking me seriously, this table actually sucks. And that is very true of being a woman in comedy. Like you'll get opportunities, you'll get the roles, you get the movies, and still every step of the way, someone's gonna be there being like, mm, are you sure? I don't know if that's right, da 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 da. And someone's gonna be, wanna be speaking on your experiences and speaking on your behalf. Having said all of that, you have to just be so passionate about what you're doing to the point where you are relentless. Like if you're a little bit passionate, this is not gonna work. If you're like a little bit committed and dedicated, this is not gonna work. Anything in film, especially if you're a woman, you have to be so dedicated to the point where you're like, it doesn't matter what hater on the internet, what critic, what anyone says, my passion is greater than that thing. And it will be tested every single time. So really I, the advice I can give you is when you go home today, really ask yourself, how passionate am I? And if it's not like the number one emotion you have, you gotta rethink that because you will be tested every single day, honestly. Excellent. Um, Lara wants to know where people can watch Doing It after South by Southwest. That's a great question. There's three screenings at South by Southwest and then what you need to do is you need to go on the internet and you need to tweet and post and I tweet, oh my God, how, how retro. You need to post about how you would love to see this film so someone buys it because someone needs to buy this 
for a lot of money so that more movies like this can be made. That's the honest answer, is we're looking for distribution. So um, I, if, even if you're not free to come to the premiere or come to one of the screenings, please, from the bottom of my heart, if I can ask you anything, the hashtag is doing it movie, D-O-I-N, not doing, doing it movie. Use the hashtag, post about it. If you're on Letterboxd, review it. It all matters when we're trying to get distribution, so spread the word, and hopefully the answer to that question is gonna be everywhere, <laughs> hopefully. Well, did you ever test out humorous lines or jokes on people before adding them, to, sorry, before adding them to the film to see what people would laugh at the most? Elizabeth would like to know. We actually did. There is a joke in the movie that me and Polly disagreed on. It was a pop culture reference and both of us are so freaking stubborn. Where I was like, my joke's funnier. And she's like, my version's funnier. We mass texted people on our phone. No big deal, but my version is in the movie. Um, <clears throat> Can we take an informal poll here, actually, guys? All right, show of hands. Okay, you want to do this? You want to do, <laughs> well, right do this right now? I want to do this right now. You want to? Okay, okay. All right. <laughs> you don't bias the question, though. I'm not going to bias okay, anything. Right, I'm just cool. going to show of hands. Now. Everyone has to participate, okay? Who in this theater knows what Scott Pilgrim looks like? Or who knows who Scott Pilgrim is? Or who it is, okay? Okay, okay. Who in this theater knows who Bill Hader is? <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> Mine is in the movie. <laughs> Mine is in the movie. But I still think the joke, you can decide. It's funny still. It's, it's still, still funny. funny. It's still funny. But you know what? But you need partners like this. <laughs> See, because here's another challenge. Let me tell you something. If any of you, or maybe you are, if you want to be talent or whatever, let me tell you one of the hardest things of this job is when you become kind of successful like I am. People don't call you out on your crap. One time I went on a set and someone literally told me, it's okay if you're late. It's okay if you don't do what they want you to do. Like, you're the talent. Someone has literally told me that. You, they, people are trying to melt your mind into turning into a diva and turning into like a person that doesn't want to do work. You need people like this that will call you out and be like, no, I'm challenging you on this. Like you gotta do what you say you're gonna do and you gotta be a freaking good person. And my team, every person that has interacted with my team this week has said the same thing to me. Your team is freaking amazing and they're really, really good because they're good at their job, they're nice people and they call me out on my ish. If no one around you is challenging you and questioning you, Get better people around you. Honestly, that is a number. That is a piece of advice I can give you too. We are recording this, right? I can <laughs> reference this whenever I need to in the future. Correct. Great. Great. All right. One last question. Okay. What is next for you and Unicorn Island Productions? So our entire mission at Unicorn Island um, is one to sound like professional adults, which is why our name is Unicorn Island. Um, but it is to create content that is really entertaining, is really enjoyable to laugh, funny. You know good entertainment, but that has a message. I'm not in the business of making any content that adds noise to the world just for the sake of adding noise. I want there to be some social messaging, some impact, some culture that could be changed. So leaving the world better, changing culture for the better in some way. I think storytelling and entertainment is the best way to do that. And so we have a slate full of TV shows and films that we're really excited about that hopefully are like amazing and the good message is lathered in sugar and other good stuff, but like that makes you think. Any one project in particular you want to talk about? I really, in the last 30 seconds, I will say the next dream project, Investor, the next dream project that I want to invest in that has to have a big, bigger budget than this one, is um, bigger, bigger set pieces, is um, it, my, I have a group of aunties who I'm obsessed with. My mom is part of them. I'm obsessed with my aunties. I love them so much. They literally call themselves the fun gang. They have a WhatsApp group called The Fun Gang, and they are unlike any Indian auntie I've ever seen on screen. They take shots, they tell sex jokes, they grind on each other at parties. I'm like, this is the movie I wanna see, so I wanna make a heist movie about The Fun Gang. So, isn't that bomb? With a group of aunties. With a group of aunties. I don't even need to be in it. I just want a group of older aunties and for them to finally be the main character they deserve to be. That is what I want. Thank you so much for being here, y'all. Please support the film. Appreciate all of your support. Appreciate you taking the time. Polly, amazing job moderating. Great job. Thank you. Appreciate y'all.